Well, we'll go ahead and get started today. So thank you again for those of you for tuning in to our live Business as Unusual webinar series. My name is Lisa Baining. I'm one of our account managers at Red Caffeine, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. We are so excited to be talking today about inspiration, innovation, and definitely a dose of positivity as we dive into today's session. We are focused on speaking with badass leaders to learn what they've been doing during the COVID-19 pandemic and how they're looking forward to the future. And you're definitely going to get that high dose of energy and optimism from today's speaker. As a few housekeeping notes, we do have everyone on mute today. So if you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function or the QA option. You can find those in the bottom of your screen. I'll be looking for questions throughout today's session and we'll make sure that our speaker answers them at the end of it. As a note, we did have our first five winners uh, for signing up to the webinar in an effort to support other small businesses, especially restaurants who have been very hard hit during this economic climate. Uh, we went ahead and uh, had people sign up and the winners so far have selected, uh, we have House of Taco in Jackson, Michigan. And I also have a few others that said they'll be using their voucher later on today. So as a note, when you sign up early, you also have the chance to win. I know Kathy is supporting Shannon's Deli in Lombard, Illinois, right across the street from our office, which is one of our personal favorites. So as we go ahead and get started with today's session, I wanted to share and see, just get a, a poll from the audience on where we're at. So I'm going to go ahead and share a question on my screen if you can answer that. Out of everything, so our speaker today is really going to focus on the three C's of business, culture, capabilities, and capacity. If you had a look at your business, what C of those three C's do you feel your company needs to work on the most? So we're going to head and give everyone just a few moments to think about that question. Results are anonymous, so we're just getting a pulse check. Give everyone a few more minutes here to respond, or moments I should say. All right, a few more answers coming in. Capabilities, go capabilities. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead, we'll end the poll here and go ahead and share results. So hopefully you're all seeing that. As you can see by a landscaping round, definitely working on capabilities. And I know our speaker today is going to cover all three of those areas as far as what our machine and tool has been doing. And through that, hopefully giving you some great takeaways on what you can do with your own business. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started here and I'd like to introduce our speaker today or our main host, Kathy Steele, principal and owner of Red Cafe. And so good morning, or I guess good afternoon, Kathy. Good afternoon. And so I'm so excited uh, to be with my longtime friend, Jim Carr. I hate to be so far from you, Jim. I'd rather be sitting right next to you, but um, you no, know, we're still doing some remote things. I, I'd love for you to just first start us off, but just kind of telling us about you, a little bit about car, machine, and just introducing what you do. Sure. Hey, first and foremost, thanks for, for having me on today. I, I, it's still kind of odd to think that people really care about what I have to say that, you know, people are actually showing up to, to listen to what I have to say. But at the end of the day, I guess I have quite a few years of experience in manufacturing and, um, and I'm willing to share that with people that want to listen. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so yeah, my name is Jim Carr. I'm the president and um, owner of Car Machine and Tool in Elk Grove Village. We are a precision contract machine shop. We do work for aerospace, medical, space and exploration, military, and automated equipment. Those industries kind of ebb and flow at months and years, and we're pivoting a little bit based on how the economy is, but uh, really high value, high quality pre precision machine um, components. Um, my dad founded this company in 1972 uh, in the garage of our suburban Chicago house. Um, Within six months, we moved to Elk Grove to a leased space and have moved four times since then, um, still within the village of Elk Grove. Um, I'm happy to say that the third generation is working now in the company full time, five years, doing an excellent job. 
and uh, we're working on that succession plan now. So, and then otherwise, um, about six years ago, uh, a friend of mine, Jason Zanger, and I started a, a podcast. Jason came to me and said, hey, Jim, do you know what a podcast is? And I said, yeah. He said, do you listen to them? I said, no. He said, well, I think that the opportunity is good. Opportunity, remember that word, is good right now to look at starting one. And it took me about uh, 24, 36 hours, and I got back with them. I said, yeah, I think it's a good idea. I had an aha moment. I said, let's, let's, how much time and investment am I going to have to put into that podcast? Um, and I, when I thought about it, it really wasn't a monetary number. It was more, it was more just my personal time, which has value, but I thought I could give that up. So uh, that's me. That's the truncated version of me and my manufacturing experience over the last 40 years. So. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's start off with talking a bit about culture, and you know, and it is it's so interesting to run a business, but to run a family business, a legacy business um, that you've taken over from your parents or your father. Um, tell us a little bit. Uh, we're gonna just queue up a, a short video of yeah. your business culture, and then we'll talk a little bit more about culture. Sure. <laughs> My dad founded the company in 1973 in the garage of our Chicago suburban house. He had a lot of drive and a lot of passion for what he did. We manufacture precision machine component parts for the Department of Defense, aerospace, aviation, and space and exploration, and automated equipment. I used to sell machine tools, which are these machines behind me, and I really wanted to sell a machine a car. So I came in one Saturday. I knew they had a great culture. I thought that, you know, they want to buy a machine for me. It's an up and up company. I loved it so much that I ended up working here at Car after meeting Jim. We have a lot of millennials working here. We're more aggressive. We're kind of like a West Coast shop, but in the Midwest. The moment I knew I was in the right place was probably early on because just the fact that Jim was available to communicate with me was just amazing to me and, and that to me was first class and it helped me because when I work at a company I really want to learn it from the ground up. I've been here for 21 years we teach people every day we have a best team so far that I've seen in years. If you speak up people will listen and a lot of times we make a decision based on you. We started doing weekly production meetings everyone gets together let's talk about our problems what do we have and through that intimacy and that weekly cultural elevation has really helped us pull more culture into the company. Then it moved into core values. We narrowed it down to four things, which became flex, fly, play, and energize. My proudest moment was probably winning the culture award for core values because we really believe in them and we really practice them. I want to see us grow. I want to see us flourish. I want to see people that can learn and have personal growth in their career. Um, that really is one of the things that inspires me. So Jim, since okay. I've known you a while, uh, you know, culture has become a, a really, a, a, something you've really focused hard on elevating. And can you tell, talk a bit about why you think it can really make or break your business? Well, I kind of uh, selfishly, I kind of copied off the red caffeine culture. I was a little um, <laughs> jealous of what you guys had going on there. And I saw how uh, committed everyone was in your team. And I really, I could, Kathy, when I came into Red Cafe and I could feel the, the, that culture is something that's live and, and, and obvious when you meet anybody that's par part of a team that has great culture. So I saw that, I liked it, I felt it, and I thought I'm going to copy it. So, um, we did some research on it. We developed our core values um, and uh, defined them. You know, we had a list of 20 and then we really talked about culture and what it meant um, to all the employees because 
really that and that video is really the essence of car machine it is the foundation of how we set forth to go forward because at the end of the day one person two people cannot run a company your company is run on all different types of people um, quite frankly right people in the right seats um, and it's it, ever since we started practicing this about two or three years ago it's been it's been um, very rewarding and it's really changed the direction of our business it's made us more unified and more succinct and um, concrete yeah and I, I and I'm sure you're seeing your culture um, help you to kind of navigate some of the the challenging dynamics we've all encountered in this in this year yeah we, we hire fire and evaluate our employees based on culture that's how important it is so if I have a new hire a prospect I bring them in I interview them once then I bring them out and I bring them in a second time. And then if I really feel that this person is a good fit, I make every person in the company have a little personal interview with that person. And then we meet right after that and say, what did you feel like? What was the vibe? How did you feel about that person? Because you know and I know and everyone that's listening knows that when you meet somebody for the first time, in, in a matter of a few minutes, you can get a pulse of how that person's core is and what they what they're all about. So, and I think that's important because all, all we all have to work together. You know, we we need to be together uh, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. So it's really important that everyone understands each other and feels a connection. Yeah, I would. I, I have to say, one of our earlier guests even mentioned that you know, it's very tough for businesses to measure culture. Um, it's a tough metric, uh, but it is very you, tough. Yeah, he really felt like he was seeing um, culture metrics show up in how his people reacted to some of the conditions that we've all been faced with this year in a, in a pretty rapid place. So, I, you know, culture is one thing, but I, I think what you and I both know is that businesses need systems and we're both big um, fans of the entrepreneurial operating system, EOS. So can you yep. speak? to um, you know that experience at a high level and then like how you know how it's impacting you know what you're doing strategically this year sure happy to so fun funny story you know when we when Jason and I started the podcast Jason was all culture and blah blah and all that and we kept talking about it on the show we kept interviewing people that had you know all these great cultural fits and um, this resounding book called Traction came up quite often in by Gene, Traction by Gino Wickman, and it's the EOS, uh, Entrepreneurial Operating System. It's a systematized way to run your business. And, you know, I would say for a year or two, I, we, I kept hearing this resounding book. And I thought, you know what? What have I got, what have I got to lose? So I had, I, I defined our leadership team and bought a copy of the book for everybody. And I said, okay, we're going to read one chapter every week and just sit in our weekly L10s, which is your leadership team. And we're going to talk about it. And we're going to go through every chapter and just understand what it's all about. Um, it was a slow process. I don't know how many chapters are in traction, but um, within that, within a couple months, we were up and running. We used a integrator um, kind of pro bono a little bit. He kind of helped us because we're a smaller company. Uh, and um, ever since we've been practicing EOS, you know, defining our rocks, defining our to-dos, going over issues, uh, high level problems that a company has. And you have to really trust your leadership team to give you solid, honest, and authentic answers. And, and, we solved so many issues, I would say first quarter 2019, um, and still to this day, based on the, the EOS system. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. I think it's been, I, we have only been using it since last um, November, December, and it's been, it, it's just been phenomenally um, progressing us around just really problem solving and being more effective as leaders in our organization. So I, I, I also um, highly 
recommend it. So let's talk a bit about, you know, what's going on with you guys right now. You, you've been, sure. um, you know, we've been in this kind of crazy tumultuous year. Um, what, tell us a little bit about what's going positively, you know, for you or, um, I know you're making some bold moves. So tell us a little bit about. We are, you're doing. we are. So, so through the EOS system, um, you know, we define, our leadership team defines rock. So rock is a quarterly goal that you want to hit. I mean, you have, you have one-year goals, you have three-year goals, you have 10-year goals, but most importantly, we have quarterly goals that we want to hit. And, and we knew that we needed to pivot into different industries. We knew that our brand was aligned with high-value high-end OEMs, we knew that, that, that there was an alignment there. We just needed to penetrate that, those industries. So we really made a concerted effort to, to go for it. We were strategic in how we approached those OEMs and um, decided that we probably needed to, to move. I've been in this building for many, many decades. I don't even want to tell you how many years. But um, it was my rock to make the decision to move. Where, when, how much, how big, and you know, it was up to me. I'm, I'm the leader of the company, I'm the owner, so I thought that was an appropriate rock for me to be tasked with. So um, it, it, I didn't make my, quarter, my first quarter 2020 rock because I, kind of just blew through it. But as we set our rocks for the next quarter, and then this pandemic happened, I really started to think about this is an opportunity, not because the way real estate was going or anything. I just thought, you know, this is the craziest thing I've ever been through in my life. And I've been around for quite a few years. And <laughs> it's not, I mean, and I thought, you know what? It's now is the time. Now is the time to pivot, to make a shift, to take a little bit of risk. Because at the end of the day, you know as well as I do, Kathy, that growing a business, there's a, there's a huge risk responsibility. So um, I met with a realtor. I said, let's get real about this. And we started looking and uh, we just, we do right now have a contract for a new space here, quite frankly, in Elk Grove Village. Um, and it's about nearly three times as the size that we have right now. I think it's 2.72% more than what we have. But uh, I, I've never been more excited in my life because I really believe that new building is going to be aligned with my personal brand, my business brand, and a brand that a high-value OEM would be seeking out. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I couldn't be more excited for you. I'm actually Thanks. glad you're speaking Elk Grove, of course, but uh, we, we, you know, definitely have seen so much data around making offensive investments in a climate right now. And, and we always have to be somewhat conservative. And I think systems like EOS and financial, um, you know, acumen help you be both um, conservative with decisions, but also, you know, being advantageous when there is an, a growth opportunity. And do you see that opportunity for growth as more like organic market share growth? Are you thinking this might even allow you to enter some new marketplaces? Absolutely, enter new marketplaces. It's already happening right now. Um, I think that, you know, everyone's, this has been such a disruptor, Kathy, that I think that people are just, no, no one's doing things the way they used to, right? First and foremost, what percent of our working pop, what percent of our working population is working from home nowadays? Yeah. Think about what that. Think about just that one thing. How disruptive that has been to our economy, to the way we we work. Yeah. So, just that one thing. So, you know, I think that it's like taken a box, you know, you know, like a snow globe. So here's the world that we live in, the snow globe that we were in before, there was no activity. And I feel like there was just a, a 7.2 earthquake on that snow globe and everything's just mixed up. So boom, I think, my personal opinion is, 
now is the time to take a little risk because it's an opportunity for change. There's so much change happening. Your change may not necessarily be that difficult right now. Yeah, no. Makes sense? It, I, I mean, I agree. I, I, I think that, you know, we can, it, it, I don't, I think in any year that you're approaching, um, thinking about where your company is going to grow, you're, you're going to have to take a little bit of, of calculated risk. And by looking at some of the market in, indicators and, and placing bets in smart ways, I, I, I also believe this is uh, a time to be a little opportunistic. Um, yeah. So I was going to say something else. I, I also think that for my industry, for manufacturing, this is another great opportunity that we're approaching. I've talked to a couple business leaders already in my leadership team about this, but um, I don't necessarily think it's going to be um, profound in 2020, but 2021, 2022, we, you know, and I, I'm not an economist. I don't have a crystal ball, but we truly believe that 2021, 2022 is going to be huge for our industry for reshoring just because of what we've been through about the supply chain issues that a lot of the domestic people are, are hitting. Um, we really believe there's going to be a huge um, surge in domestic production here in the United States in the future i.e. that's one of the reasons why we thought we would invest in capacity um, and capabilities yeah. in this move. No. Setting ourselves, we're, we're getting ready for a, another manufacturing renaissance. I, I, and I agree. And, and you know what's so great about that and the, the concept of that is that you will have impact on so many ancillary marketplaces because as, as we're doing more here in, in the U.S., we, we will, that will have a ripple effect on other business. Um, it has to, it absolutely has to. And, and, you know, I, and it's, it's about time. We shouldn't be so paralyzed by um, not being able to produce things because we are not getting access to the components and parts, um, you know, in our, in our communities or, or in a, a shorter lead time so we can build things faster. So exactly. Um, you know, cool. talking about that is, is very exciting, but, you know, in thinking about sales, um, you, you did sort of make a bold statement about this newer approach to sales, but there's also some old school things that are coming back. You even mentioned cold calling. <laughs> so talk a little bit about. Yeah, I remember that. Remember what that yeah. was? Remember like, what, a, what, remember what a landline was? Look, yeah. are, are, are they even, are they even relevant anymore? I don't know. Um, all I know is again, there's been su such a disruption on our business that, you know, people are doing things entirely different than what we used to do. And if that means we've gone from emailing communication, what do you know? We're going to pick up the phone and we're going to call. And guess what? The people are going to answer. So I talked to my sales manager, John, and he said, you know what? He said, it's really weird. He said, people are starting to answer their phone again. And maybe because people are at home, maybe they feel more comfortable answering the phone, or maybe they're not so busy. Right. Maybe they just want to talk to somebody. Maybe people just want to talk about the pandemic. Maybe people just want to share, you know, my grandma got it, or, you know, maybe people, I think people want to talk because we're all isolated. So I think people are, are yearning for connection. So um, yeah, I think cold calling is back. I don't know if it's going to be, you know, around for the next two years, but I think for right now, I think there's an opportunity for cold calling. Yeah. And I, and I think it's just that your approach, if you're trying to directly sell somebody on a cold call, that's not the approach. As long as you are coming at it from a place of care and concern and, and, and being a resource that can be helpful. I absolutely agree. We're seeing a lot of response to picking up the phone and having a conversation. And, and so on that note, this is somebody had sent us a, a question about marketing and, you know, you do really um, champion the idea of marketing. Can you talk to why that's such an important fact, factor in your um, business strategy? Yeah. So I never really knew what marketing was until, you know, 10, 15 years ago when, when I was introduced to you and Julie. And I just, I kind of gravitated to 
people, creatives, um, marketing people, you know, Patricia Miller, Julie, you, your entire staff. And I really can identify with creatives. And um, I, I guess I have this need to, to feel like marketing has been something that is out there. It's a relevant thing and you need to stay top of mind all the time. So um, I really witnessed the importance of it and how important it is to keep it healthy. It's, you just can't start a website, do one thing for two months. It's, it's something that takes time to do all the time. Um, you, can't, it, you can't stop and go with it. Um, I think it's important to um, be out there. I think it's important to utilize social media. It's, you know, social media is, well, especially nowadays, it's been getting a bad rap, but um, I think A, first and foremost, there's no cost to social media except your time and investment in creating posts. It's a great platform to highlight your wares. You know, if you're a manufacturer, you can show the parts that you make. If you're in clothing, you can show textiles. If you're, you know, if you're a dentist, you can show teeth or whatever, whatever the case is. I think that um, social media is a, is a really powerful way to market yourself to, to get your name out there and your brand, your brand out there and, and create a brand around your business. Um, yeah, I, I fully endorse um, any kind of marketing um, process that, that's out there. The only thing I will tell people is marketing is something that has to stay fluid. Um, you have to make a, an investment into it, and it has to, it has to stay on. It, it can't be stop and go. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I believe in it and I, I also feel like it has to be strategic and, and a bit focused as well so that you're getting actual outcomes. But when it's teamed up with sales and it really becomes a, a tool um, with your sales process, it, it's, it's really creating that kind of the same thing that EOS creates. It creates your revenue generation system, which is a combination of, of marketing tools and, yeah. and sales yeah. tools. You really need to know, I think first and foremost, if you're entering into a marketing um, process, you really need to know who your target market is. And once you determine that and you've really filtered it through a few times, um, then you can start your marketing program um, and go from there. Yeah, I mean, you've done such a great job with your positioning and really, I think that's paid off to kind of seeing Thanks. who you, you know, who you are in the marketplace. It's, it's very clear and differentiated. So, so um, marketing, uh, you know, as a, an opportunity, I, I cannot negate talking a little bit more in detail about making chips. I have to, yeah. you know, I was there in the early days and I was, yeah, you not, were. I was not, uh, full disclosure, I was not a believer. I was a little bit like skeptical. Kathy, come on. Are you kidding me? Like manufacturers listening to podcasts. I, I don't know. I don't know what this sounds Who like. knew? Who knew? Yeah. I know. Right? Well, Who honestly, knew? it surprised me too. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie either. I you know, but it was I was willing to take a chance and take a little bit of a risk. Right. Right. So, so you, did, you didn't think it was going to fly. So yeah, I didn't either. And should I, I can be happy to talk about that. Um, yeah, I can remember early on in the early days, we, Jason and I were, you know, crafting the structure on how to run this business and what to do. I, I, I didn't know what the hell was going on. Um, and we would show up to do our first recording and we'd be going through all the electronics and the microphones and we'd say, oh my God, we don't even have a cord. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> we'd have to reschedule the next record. And, you know, with both of us running independent manufacturing companies, time was difficult. So, and then, you know, and then we finally figured out how to record our voices onto a, a disc. And then where are we going to record? I remember being at Jason's um, 
in his furnace room in Melrose Park, which, you know, Melrose Park, Illinois, is like right next to O'Hare. I can remember waiting for the planes after they'd land because there was so much background noise. That jet was probably about 100 feet off the top of his building. So, I mean, we've come a long way. And, um, yeah, we're, we're at a half a million downloads right now. We get, on average, about 10,000 downloads a month. So, so it's, it's incredible. I mean, you're super legit. You, it's a revenue, it's, it's a business. You generate revenue. It is a business. Yeah. So I mean, we do. I am glad to be a little bit wrong, you know, and, and don't tell my husband, I'm sure he never hears me say that. So, um, no, it's okay to be, it's okay. You learn from, you learn from mistakes or errors. And I mean, I just think it goes back, Kathy, to just taking a chance and taking a little bit of a risk. And kind of vetting it out in your head. Does, do, do, does everything make sense? Do, is everything aligned? Is now the right time? And you, you just try to do it and, and then you, then you got to work at it, right? You just can't, it's just not going to happen organically. You, what do you know? You got to work, right? Oh, so yeah, absolutely. And, and you guys are a lot of fun. And, and I, I, I think what you've done is you've built um, a forum to talk about some of the everyday problems. I mean, I was just, you know, looking at all the different topics you cover. You keep something that you talk about very laser focused, very, you know, totally only a manufacturing audience would care about. And then you talk about leadership and, and economic conditions. And, and there's just so, you cover all the um, challenges is, that we face as business runners. So it's relevant even outside the manufacturing space. And I, you know, I'm a big fan of it as well. Yeah, thanks. So our, the mission of the podcast is to equip and inspire a manufacturing leader. So our target audience, remember I mentioned target audience, is a manufacturing leader. So a C-suite leader, COO, CEO, CEO, CFO, somebody in that level. I mean, of course, we have, you know, machinists that listen to the show because there's relevant information for them too. But our target, you know, laser, laser targeted at that level person in a manufacturing company. And we, we believe that we're hitting that target all the time. So we have to craft our conversation to that target audience. Um, and yeah. I guess it's been working. What we do know is we, a bartender in San Francisco probably does not listen to making chips because there's nothing that we're talking about is relevant to them. So we know that the, we know the audience that we're touching is somehow or for sure connected to manufacturing. Yeah. Well, even people that are ancillary, you know, we're not in manufacturing, but we have about a 70% concentration of um, our portfolio is manufacturing. So we care about what our clients care about too. So it's, it's great right. for, you know, for us as well. So I want to ask something a little bit personal. Um, I, I sure. love to hear about, you know, what, um, what you've learned about yourself and I, and you don't have to just speak to this 2020 year, but I, you know, we're both a little bit older um, and, and I feel like I'm a constantly learning um, so much. So can you share about, so, you know, what you've learned either recently or in the last year about yourself that's kind of been surprising? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, I think authenticity, not being afraid of uh, who you are and just you know not trying to filter for an audience um i also believe that i've learned that taking a little bit of a risk is okay because you know all we all i i we jason and i did a podcast about this once about the only way you're going to grow is if you push yourself into a um an uncomfortable feeling you, you know you know when you're when you decide to do something and you really are hesitant to do it and you feel like you're a little uncomfortable about doing that, it's not feeling good, um, it's okay to push yourself out of your comfort zone because what you do is once you do that, you push yourself out of your comfort zone, your box gets bigger. And then if you push yourself out of your comfort zone even more, the box is going to get bigger. And eventually all of those things that you were afraid to do or um, worried about, they're not so big anymore. Right. So I think, I really believe that pushing yourself out of your comfort zone 
not aggressively, you know, I'm not going to jump off a bridge. Um, <laughs> but, you know, just like, you know, maybe five years ago, I'd be really hesitant to do this live webinar with you because I didn't feel as though I'd feel comfortable doing it. I mean, now it's, it's no problem at all, but I, I really, uh, would tell people to just start practicing that. And you know, if you're pushing yourself out of your comfort, comfort zone, because you're going to feel that little uneasiness in you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've seen you take some major steps in the, you know, probably the last 10 years that I've known you being the chairman of the TMA and start launching the podcast. I mean, you've really made some big steps and, and taken on some, some big big task. So I, I think, you know, you're dead on it. It really does. Well, it, it all hasn't been, I mean, there's been some errors along the way, but you know, you just pick, you, you learn from those and then you move on. You know, I think that failure is a good thing in some, in some instances too, because um, you know, it's just like the old adage that, you know, when you're a kid and you burn yourself with a match, that'll never happen again. Um, so I think failure is, is healthy. I really, I genuinely believe fail, failure is healthy. So take that risk. And if you win, great. If you fail, great. You learned something from that. Um, it just, yeah. you know, you don't want to take your whole nest egg and put it on the stock market because you feel lucky. I mean, you, you've got, you've got to be strategic in what you're going to do and it has to make sense. And, and talk to your peers if you're, if you're really thinking about making a big investment. Let Bounce an idea off one of your friends in the industry. Absolutely. Well, I think we're going to start to open it up to questions, but I have to ask you, you know, of course, you and I are both travel buffs. We love our wine. What are, what I do. You, what are you drinking these days? What's your faves? Um, well, you know, my wife only drinks Chardonnay. Well, I've gotten her to convert a little bit over to a Pinot Noir. But, um, you know, so we typically we drink a lot, of, well, a lot of Chardonnay. Um, but, you know, we've one that's really a good value that could be a that's um, really an excellent Chardonnay that can be drinking during the week. We, you know, we, we kind of have our essential weekday wine. So we've been drinking um, Ferrari Carano is a great vineyard out of Sonoma. And they have an excellent Chardonnay. It's probably one of the best value for the dollar out there right now. Um, and then of course, on the weekends, if you know, the budget allows, we would lo we love cake bread. Cake bread Chardonnay is awesome. And you know, I knew you were going to ask me this. And there's a Pinot Noir that I've been drinking. It's a really a nice Pinot Noir. Is it Bellevue or something like that? Um, it's, it's a little pricey, but it's a Pinot Noir that tastes like a Cabernet. So Pinot Noirs, as you know, are typically a little on the lighter side. This is a Pinot that tastes like a Cabernet, so I highly recommend it. And I apologize, I don't have the name of it. I, if I saw the label, I'd know, but I don't we'll we'll know it off the top of my head. We'll send it out in the show notes. But uh, okay. yeah, I, I have to say that I, of course, drink a little more white wine in the summer. I'm a big red fan, but... Um, I, I'm on this like dry farms wine. It's a on, mail order. It's all organic. It's really low in sugar. They curate wines that are um, that are you know made with the dry production, so they're not. Um, it, it's like just a really neat um, wine uh, group that is from all over the world. And I've had from, some from Spain and Italy and Austria. So uh, you guys should check it out because I know I know Gail. Yep. The white, the white. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not as global as, as I know you love uh, wines from France. Um, I typically stick to Sonoma, Napa, uh, Northern California. Oh, Seattle. There's some great, great vineyards. Uh, Chateau St. Michel out of Seattle okay. is awesome too. Absolutely. Love that. So, so Lisa, how are we doing on questions? Do we got some we, questions? We do you? have a few coming in. So I've got one, Jim, I'm going to dive straight to the heart of manufacturing on the first one. Go ahead. I, I think I can answer that. Hopefully. I, yeah, I think I think you're good there. So um, two part question. So we'll start with the first one. What role do you see additive manufacturing playing in the next 10 years? Hmm, good question. Um, again, I think it's evol I think that technology is evolving. Um, you know, of course, we're in we're, we're in subtractive. So we 
take a raw piece of metal and subtract the material. Additive, of course, is just mm -hmm. that. I don't know yet that additive, and I could be wrong, uh, because we don't do additive here. Um, I believe that um, it may not necessarily be able to hold the tolerances that we're doing by okay. subtractive machining. So, you know, maybe a plus or minus 1,000th tolerance dimension on an additive might be difficult to achieve, but I certainly believe there is a, um, a place for additive in the manufacturing mix and whether or not you're using additive to uh, create a um, a part and then use it to and we can subtract it to to bring the tolerance in but i definitely believe it's it's moving in that direction um and that's that's about the best i can tell you on okay. additive and then second part of that question same individual wondering um when you look at Non-prototype work, where do you see 3D printers playing? Non-prototype work for 3D printers. Yes. Um, they were so really 3D specific. Printing, so. No. so 3D printing is an additive process, right? Okay. So yes. it's, it's basically the same thing. So I would definitely think that for non-production work that additive or 3D printing can be really relevant, especially um, as the technology of those machines evolve and they can apply material faster and make create that build up faster and more closer tolerance because i know what it takes for us to do a one-off a two-off part mm -hmm. you know we had to buy that raw material we had to program it we have to select the correct tooling we had to make the setup we have to um cut the metal and that takes an enormous amount of upfront time. Actually, we, we could, I always say to people sometimes, especially our customers that don't understand it, it could take us 10 hours of non-cutting to get ready to cut the work and then only 15 minutes to actually cut the piece. So additive definitely can help in, in mitigating all of that upfront time. Mm -hmm. So definitely a spot for everyone to play and of course car specializing in that which leads me to my next question i'm going to bring it up a little bit here so jim before i ask the question i actually wanted to preface well you and i were speaking before the webinar you said you know kind of that imprinting your dna everywhere from illinois to space so really neat opportunity that car had, had. i didn't know if you could share at a high level and then i'm going to lead into our next question with that yeah, so the foundation of Car Machine and Tool was um, my dad had um, a relationship with commercial printing. So re remember what newspapers were? <laughs> you know, remember getting the Sunday paper on Sunday, that big honking thing, and everyone would go to the advertisements right away. And, and well, we don't do that anymore, right? We don't read the paper, and the general public, a, a very small percentage, doesn't read the paper anymore. So uh, we were, we were, highly involved in the manufacture of commercial printing parts, either for new printing presses and or replacement parts, the wear items for those commercial printing presses. And back in the 70s, 80s, and maybe even into the 90s, we had a, a really uh, large portion of that work. However, when we, when we saw that newspapers weren't relevant anymore, we started to pivot. And we've done a really good job in strategic pivoting. And um, I'm happy to say that, I mean, we were into medical. We're actually doing some COVID parts. I'm waiting for a package to come in right now um, that we're gonna be doing some parts for uh, COVID machinery for you know vaccine. And um, aerospace and space and exploration. We just recently shipped a part to one of our customers that is going on a SpaceX rocket to the space station in the fall. So cool. I, cool, very cool, very, very cool. Um, our, so our DNA will be flying up there somewhere. I love those where our parts go stories because I think that's yep. you know missing gap in you know how exciting manufacturing really is is that the understanding of where some of these 
pieces and parts go. Uh, you know, they, they're not really seeing the whole picture of how cool this work really is. Well, that's, you know, you tell people you're in manufacturing and, the, you know, people, you know, you can tell you're boring them because their eyes start to glaze over and, you know, they don't know what we do. But if I can, if I can relate a story to it, like COVID and um, International Space Station, and part, I don't even have to get specific. I just have to say where they're going or what they're doing or how they're integrated then people understand. And then they understand how important it is, right? W wouldn't you want to work with a machine shop that's doing parts for an airplane when you're at 30,000 feet? Yeah. Wouldn't you really hope that those parts on that plane were manufactured correct and to print and to tolerance? Yes, yes. I would. Yes, you would. I want to get back on a plane. <laughs> my parts to print. Yes, when we get back on a plane. Fingers crossed it'll be sooner than later. Yes. So actually a great question came in while you were saying that, Jim, how do we get the next generation of youth excited about mm. manufacturing? Mm. That's a very, very good question. We talk about it all the time on making ships. Um, I think that, I think we have to introduce people to the industry at a young age. Uh, some people are saying elementary school. I personally think it's a little too young. But um, I think that the, um, the image of manufacturing, well, it has changed, but people don't know it yet. You know, it's not your grandfather's machine shop anymore. This industry has so much to offer people for a career, um, a, a well-paying, long-term, mm -hmm. lifelong career that'll take care of you and your family for a lifetime. Um, but I think that if we introduce younger people to what we're doing, you know, like uh, Manufacturing Day in October is a great mm -hmm. way to invite kids, young people into our, our facilities, show them what we're doing, show them that it's not an oily, greasy uh, environment that they're going to be working. It's really highly technological and clean. And I mean, I, I can't, quite frankly, I can't believe the way we're machining parts nowadays. I couldn't do it. Uh, the, you know, we're working on fifth axis parts right now, nearly 95% of the parts we're um, generating tool pass are on Mastercam, our CAD cam system. It's going, we just bought a brand new fifth axis machine and we've got, we've got work already. The machine's only four weeks old. We're jam packed on, on that oh, wow. machine already. So I invest in your infrastructure, invest in technology. I don't think you'll ever go wrong with that. So Back to your question, we need to introduce kids to the industry. They need to see it, touch it, and feel it. Those types of people uh, with, that it would be interested are typically people that like to work with their hands. Uh, the, the guys from the automotive classes are ripe for this type of industry. Mm -hmm. People that you know um, like to build things, like to touch things, like, like the result of seeing something come to fruition when, when they're done cutting it. Yeah, and maybe, you know, just more stories like yours about telling yeah. the start, you know, um, and, and the impact it's going to have on the next, next SpaceX um, mission, so. Yeah, cool, huh? Very cool Think, Kathy, if you had the opportunity, would you, would you take a rocket into uh, outer space? Oh. I'm, now I'm asking you the question. No, I, I, I said it the other day, I, I play tennis with a pilot, and he was like, I really would love to fly a rocket, and I'm like, I don't know if you'd want me flying it, but I'd be like in your co-pilot seat. I, let's go. Let's. Would you really do it? Oh. If it was affordable in our lifetime, would you do it? Oh, for sure. For sure. I for sure. Love it. Yeah. I, I, I don't know yet, but you know, yeah. I but rest sure. assured the parts that we're making for you are the best they're to print and specifications. So. Now that I know that it's a definite, a definite <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll leave the flying up to you guys. I'm still trying yes. to get other, Thank you. other worldly fears. Um, Jim, talking a little bit more since you were talking about EOS earlier on, knowing that yeah. I'm going through the EOS process, there's always some modifications you make. So how did you really customize or tailor EOS to fit car machine? Good question. Um, well, you know, we're, we're, our business isn't, you know, it's, we're not a hundred or 200 person business. So 
we had to, and, and really EOS is typically for businesses around 25 people or larger. Mm -hmm. So we had, we kind of had to modify a little bit. Um, I think we only, we, we, we went by the book. We referenced the book often when we had issues or when we were looking at process on how to do something like still at every, for our annual meeting, I still bring out the book and we read everything on how to conduct an annual meeting because we're not using a facilitator to do it or doing it ourselves. So, um, you know, I think that you have to just do it in baby steps and, and modify it based on to how, how the size of your company. Yeah. Does that, does that answer your question or the person's question? Kathy, go ahead. I was going to ask, does everybody have rocks on your team? Okay. The leadership team. Yes. Okay. Leadership. And it's sometimes it's tried, it, it's hard to get those balanced, you know, or sometimes one of the leadership teams rock is a little bit bigger, more profound than somebody else's. But maybe the next quarter, somebody else's is like, I, I had my rock was to buy a building. So, but who else? I couldn't give that to my sales manager to go buy a building, right? It had to be up to me. So, um, but yet his responsibility is to generate sales. And now that we're buying a new building and we're increasing our capacity, he's got, he's going to have to have a rock to go out there and get sales. So, um, Yeah. No, I think that's perfect. Yeah, just how, how do you change things? So, you know, you got to make it your own. You have to make it your own. You can't, you can't be really rigid about it. I think the thing is you just got to, you got to just do it. A, do it and be consistent. You can't just do it one week and then slop, you know, uh, not do it for a couple of weeks after. You got to, you got to do it religiously. Yeah. I think that almost should be your fourth C if we do culture, capabilities, capacity, and consistency. Consistency heard, is really uh, important. Consistency in all efforts, consistency in marketing, consistency in EOS, which I think is a, a great way to end today's session. So thank you, Jim, for all of your insights, sharing all of your energy. I know Kathy and thank I you. enjoy that. As we look ahead, for those of you, if you have any other questions for Jim that you know maybe pop up later on today or in the next week, we do have his contact information up there, so you can email him or also connect with him on LinkedIn. Um, make sure to tune into Making Chips, obviously, number one manufacturing podcast. So much to learn uh, from Jim and the rest of the team. So thank you again, Jim, for joining us today. You're very welcome. My pleasure being with you. Thank you. Yeah. As we look to our next webinar, which will be June 18th, we have Chris Campbell, CEO of Review Tracker. So as we think about reviews in this world today, I know personally, if I'm going to a new restaurant, I'm going online. If I'm on Amazon, I am looking to see what other people say. So although those might be B2C instances, it is more important than ever for B2B companies to make sure that you are also considering how reviews are affecting your business. Chris has actually shared some pretty amazing statistics with us on how effective uh, a review can be or how much it's going to drive away your business. It could be even up to 94% of people avoiding you because they saw a negative review. So yeah. tune in in two weeks to hear more on how you can take reviews and make them basically a, a mission critical essential piece of your business and how to start evolving that into your strategies. You can sign up on the Red Caffeine website. We'll also be sending out an email after this. So stay tuned for more information, but we're very excited to have Chris joining us here in the next few weeks. So with that, thank you for attending today. This session was recorded, so we will email it out to all of you who did sign up and will also be available on the Red Caffeine website. This is the first time hearing about Red Caffeine and you'd like more information, feel free to connect with us online. Um, through our phone number or through our website. And we'd look forward to speaking with you. So with that, thanks so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Jim. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye, yeah, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. See you soon. Bye now. Bye, Lisa.